Hi, Adi. Thanks for coming on Twenty One Towers. Thank you, Sandeep, for having me. It's an honor. I've been chasing you since quite some time, and of course, you've been very, very busy. So, thank you for for agreeing and finally coming over. And I think this is the first podcast episode where uh, the guest has requested not to have his video. So, although we uh, we can see each other while we're recording this, the final version I think might be some kind of a waveform or something tracking your audio. Tell me the reason. Well, I'm just a guy who likes to be behind the scenes, uh, to be honest. And yeah, you know, just a bit shy uh, and private, I would say. That's pretty much it. Are there any privacy concerns, or like you just don't want your face out to be there, or anything like that? Because a lot of Bitcoiners do that. I mean, I, this yeah. is not uncommon, at least for me, being in the space. But yes, since I you mean, are my first anonymous guest, I mean, <laughs> faceless guest. Yeah. Well, sure. So uh, part of the reason could also be privacy. Um, I I do somewhat feel petrified thinking about how in some far future you know your video could be used in nefarious ways uh, that's certainly a possibility and we see that now as you are looking at these ai technologies really becoming a lot more mature and so there's definitely that for sure you know i'm uh, you know except from twitter of course i've never been a part of any social media as well for as long as i can remember and you know i guess it's 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 just a part of me it's just how i've tried to live online versus you know in my physical life where i'm obviously a lot more social than uh, what what i am online and you're a young guy obviously the audience cannot see you i don't know whether we'll have a picture of you on the youtube thumbnail i'm sure that we <laughs> won't i don't know whether you can agree to that but you so how do you how do you keep the pressures of social media like is this something that you said that you don't remember having any social media account so you were paranoid about not being online since the beginning or did that happen during the course i mean like it changed some something happened in the middle well so surely i i think it, it definitely happened early on uh, i mean i i do remember actually trying out facebook uh, way back in 2008 so you know at the time i was in india it hadn't launched yet in india it was only available for college students and so you know you would have to um, log in and then select your college and they would sort of whitelist you and really verify that you were from the college that you belong And so I remember signing up and choosing some random college somewhere in the US, and then being kicked out in a, a few days later. But that was sort of my exposure to to Facebook, and well, I mean, I was always an early adopter, you know, way back uh, in the early two thousands. There were you know Yahoo messengers and so on. So I've never been shy to try out these new networks, if you will. But you know, it it pretty soon becomes you know yeah, I, I do feel paranoid. I don't I don't feel quite safe. i feel like it's a you know especially these days you know with instagram i see a lot of my friends who are constantly scrolling uh, and it happens you know uh, with twitter as well and so i try to keep my uh, digital life sane so that i can be a lot more sane in physical life it's just i guess part of my personality so you know very surprisingly i do a digital detox every year in the beginning it normally lasts for 2 3 months but this yeah. time i think i am planning i have deleted all the apps all instagram and every app Sure. Uh, from my phone i had actually deleted youtube as well and then i realized i needed it for something so i had to <laughs> install it back i also yeah. deleted bitcoins uh price widget mm, I, and i i actually ended up watching the, I, i ended up reading a book uh, digital uh, minimalism and then i sure. ended up watching the documentary on netflix social uh, dilemma and i just yeah. realized that we are all so there is one is privacy for mm. me it was addiction like i just i just yeah. realized that I'm addicted to the phone just to check, yeah. and it's just you know you waste so many hours. So I'm actually in that process uh, uh, right now. It's it's a it's a new experience, and I hopefully it's going to be a permanent thing. But we spent quite a few minutes on uh, the reason that you're faceless, but you have a you know you're doing amazing things. Tell us a little bit about your background and how did you get into Bitcoin? Sure. So wow, uh, where do I begin? Um, I think you know it goes all the way back. to 2013 i'm talking about my exposure to bitcoin i was you know a computer science student studying in india way back in 2013 i had an opportunity to go and visit singapore uh, at the national university of singapore um i you know i i got an opportunity to work with a professor uh at nus and i spent quite some time there with him you know we were 
doing research on distributed systems, security, and cryptography. And so naturally, Bitcoin came on our radar. And I remember reading the white paper. It was a very academic introduction that I had towards Bitcoin. I did not at all um, look at it as a financial asset. Of course, you know, I was still in university. Even if I had the money, I... I mean, I didn't, even if I knew what it meant as a financial asset, you know, I'm, I'm sure I would have invested, but of course I was just an intern uh, at, at a lab, right? Um, and, but I, I, I did have a very academic introduction to it. Uh, we were able to sort of read it a couple of times, understand the nuances, you know, um, and, you know, at the time, this was just like any other paper you read in a research setting, right? You read hundreds of papers, you're, you're sort of sifting through information, um, and so Bitcoin just fell on our radar in that sense. Um, I understood it as a, a very interesting new kind of protocol that offered a solution or that solved a problem uh, that were that wasn't a new problem. You know, the, the problem of double spend and more generally the problem of uh, Byzantine General's problem uh, was actually around for quite a few decades. And, you know, Satoshi, through his Bitcoin white paper and further the implementation itself, solved it in a very interesting way. So I was fascinated with Bitcoin as a novel technology, but I hadn't quite understood the financial or societal implications of having uh, this sort of an asset, um, among many other things. Right. And so that was sort of my first introduction. Fast forward a few years later, I was back in India. Um, I read online that, you know, Bitcoin was emerging as this new kind of currency online, especially in the dark web. And I remember thinking, surely it can't work as money, right? Like money is supposed to be something that the governments issue. Um, and, you know, even as an asset, you know, it's just so volatile. Like, what does it even mean to <clears throat> use Bitcoin as money? Because it it's just swinging, right, in price every now and then. And, and so I was, was even yeah, after a couple of years. Yeah, this was, I think, somewhere in 2015. Yeah. And so I was skeptical. You know, I mean, I, I be, my introduction was a very academic introduction. I understood it as a novel solution to a novel problem. And then pretty, uh, you know, quite soon after in 2015, um, I'm reading online that it's being used as money, right? Um, but, you know, still sort of skeptical about its use as money because obviously we were taught that money is supposed to behave and look uh, different. This um, is going to be super interesting. Such a long process to get into Bitcoin. And now, yeah. I mean, of course, we'll come to that part of how yeah. you're involved with Bitcoin right at the core. And I, I think the point that I'm, I, I want to make, I think for the audience is that Bitcoiners are not born Bitcoiners. I think everybody yeah. had their own journey. Yeah. Everybody was hit by Bitcoin. Everybody had their initial skepticism. Yeah. And yeah, some people got it. And those who got it, I think like you have decided to de almost dedicate your life. So go ahead. I know it's fascinating. And, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's fascinating for every person who starts to understand Bitcoin. We all start somewhat skeptical. We spend time with it, keep hearing it every now and then for a good number of years. And only when we sort of dip our toes into it, when it's, you know, come into our radar a couple of times, do we actually pay attention and start going down that proverbial uh, rabbit hole. Yeah. So, well, um, you know, I, I finally I graduated from from university. I had a job at big tech as an engineer. Um, and, you know, this was a time when I was when I actually was making money. Right. I had a good job. I was starting to think about how do I, uh, you know, manage my money, take care of my money. And as they say, make money work for you. Right. And that's when, among many other things that I was researching, you know, Bitcoin as a financial asset first sort of that sort of a framing first came on my radar where, you know, even beyond Bitcoin as a technology and even beyond Bitcoin as money itself, I actually started looking at it as an investment asset. And this was, you know, the time when Bitcoin was running up uh, all the way up to 20,000 some, sometime in late 2017, early 2018. Yeah. Yes. And so I was caught in that ride, uh, obviously, just like so many others at the time. Yeah. Um, and I remember, you know, sort of dabbling in it uh, but then, you know, Bitcoin quickly falling in price, uh, I would say, you know, humongously, right? Yeah. Um, but then, so I was stuck with... <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying from 19,000, it went from yeah. 8 to 19,000 in three months. I think this was the end of 2018. Yeah. 
and yeah. then just dramatically fell in Jan, I think back to like seven, 8,000 levels. Uh, so it That's was like right. this three month journey. Yeah. Yeah. Late and, 2017, early 2018, the whole 2018 year was, you know, it continued to fall all the way to I think 3000 or $3,500 uh back in december 2018 right so so i was part of that Sorry, cycle yeah. end 2017 not end 2018 yeah. you're right yeah correct yeah go ahead um and so you know i was you know this is sort of you know go, going back to early 2018 i've i've dabbled in in this new interesting thing and now it's continuously falling right but now that you have your hands dirty you begin to try to analyze um what is it that you've really bought right um, and you're able to sort of think independently and critically, and you're no more in that herd mentality, right? So when you're when the, when the price is going up, you know you're buying because everyone else is buying, but of course when it's going down, you know you start to sort of really truly think and ask, uh, you know, what is it that you've bought? Will it you know, go back up or not? Like you you sort of you start having all sorts of conversations around that, and then you sort of dig deep, right? So. So the whole of 2018 was essentially my education in Bitcoin. It's history, you know, right from the history of money to uh, how Bitcoin solved, uh, you know, some really interesting problems in computer science and therefore uh, also in economics, you know, by sort of reinventing money from first principles. And then, Any of course, specific resources you remember, which really like. Uh, you know, yeah, really absolutely. Like so I think I think that my first a really moment of revelation was when I read John Pfeiffer's paper on, uh, I think it's titled as an institutional investor's take on crypto assets. Yeah. Um, That's an epic and, you know, yeah. this, I think there was a medium article and there was also a PDF somewhere online. I just happened to stumble on it. And this is that analysis. To that paper in the show notes below, just for the audience. Go yeah. ahead. Absolutely. And just the analysis that, you know, John Pfeiffer did, uh, which still holds true till today, right? I think it's it has stood the test of time in terms of analyzing Bitcoin as a financial asset from the lens of an investor. And also, to some extent, critiquing some of the other tokens out there, right? Because this was a time exactly. when it wasn't just Bitcoin, but also thousand other coins and tokens yeah. and, you know, their own economies and utilities and a lot of speculation around them. Yeah, and, and so they were separate, all doing well. They're all doing well. I mean, yeah. some of them obviously, you know, outperform Bitcoin if you know, purely yeah. from a right. from a you know gains perspective. Yeah. Um, what a short period so, of time to mention. <laughs> yes, uh, obviously, yeah. you know, it, it all came crashing down, and you know, no one has even uh, heard of them. Uh, no one knows about them today, right? They all died. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was very difficult. If you were caught in that hype, it was very difficult to sort of discern yourself from the noise and try to think critically about what is it uh, around uh, about Bitcoin that um, that essentially would hold its value over time or maybe even increase its value over time as an investment asset and why it would not apply to the other tokens out there, right? Or, like, all the way from Ethereum to everything else at the time. Yes. Um, so his paper was, you know, I think some final for me to uh, really... Uh, you know, have an adult lens of sorts and look at it from a purely financial investment uh, lens. Um, and then, you know, I, I sort of moved on to uh, the Bitcoin standard, obviously. Um, so that was an interesting, uh, that book was an interesting journey into the history of money and perhaps also an introduction to Austrian economics, which was the first time we sort of came across it um, as, as a way of thinking about markets and economy. Um, yeah. And, you know, both being from first principles. So even John Pfeiffer's paper, as well as Bitcoin standard, they were all approaching Bitcoin from first principles, you know, without, and, you know, first principles, I, I like to think of them as something that stand the test of time that, you know, are more common sense than voodoo magic. Right. And so both the papers approached it as something from first principles, uh, you know, re would really appeal to the common sense in you. And that's what got me started into, um, really appreciating Bitcoin, not just as a technology, but also an asset that I think has some very important societal implications. It's, 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 it's almost tragic to me that the Bitcoin standard, I think has sold only 15,000 copies. It's the number one resource that I mentioned. I'm going to start mentioning this article as well, actually. I think it's a great resource which you've pointed out. 
uh, and I can't believe that that epic book, which is also the first book, I actually have copies of it in my house. I just give it to people. Uh, sure. You know, if somebody seriously interested, fifteen thousand yeah. copies, it's terrible. But anyway, <laughs> big fan of Safe Safadine for the book. Very controversial sure. <laughs> things yeah. going on Absolutely. with him right now. But anyways, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, well, I haven't caught up to the controversy, but you know, as 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 we've all come to understand, I think each of us. The, the beauty about Bitcoin is that each of us may have our own personal beliefs about so many different things in life, but we all converge on Bitcoin, and so that that says a lot about Bitcoin. Uh, the the fact that it is this bipartisan thing, if you will, it is something that you know helps the rich as well as the poor. Helps you know, doesn't matter what race or what identity or gender you have. I think it's something. It's a force for good for all, which is something it phenomenal. Doesn't feel very bipartisan right now, at least in U.S. politics. I don't know if you follow the regular regulation in the U.S. I'm sure you do, but the Democrats are pretty much, you know, trying to attack Bitcoin. And the, I think some of the you know the Republicans, which I struggle to like, but you know I like them because I think they are a little bit right right now more pro Bitcoin. But um, yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think I meant it as bipartisan, more in the sense of the citizens, right? Yeah, in terms yeah. of how it helps the liberals as well as the progressives, you know, as well as the conservatives. Totally. When you think about it from the first principles, it actually helps and makes things easier for you know whoever or whatever school of thought you come from. Yeah. I, I, and so, continue your journey into the things that projects and companies that you're involved with all some really big names in Bitcoin. So, Sure. Um, so, you know, I think all through 2018, 2019, I was, I was sort of, you know, spending all my nights and weekends on Bitcoin, of course, uh, while having a day job at a big tech company as an engineer and then as a product manager. And I was hoping to maybe contribute to Bitcoin in, um, uh, you know, in a full-time capacity. Um, and in you my mean work- a core developer? Um, you mean Bitcoin core developer? Yeah. Oh no. Or or you mean like an engineer in the company? Both. I mean, like, what did you mean when you said like as a full time Bitcoin, like you wanted to contribute to Bitcoin development sure. in like as a in a company or as a Bitcoin core developer? Well, what in, was in any mind? capacity. In okay. any capacity. You yeah. So to I was to yeah. the project. Yeah. Yeah. I was you know I was working on software, and then Bitcoin yeah. happened to be a technology I could contribute to it in more ways than just. Um, you know, proselytizing it. Um, yes, and so, yes. and so, you know, I was looking for a technology role, uh, but I was also looking to sort of, you know, help um, Bitcoin education in some sense, you know, being a developer myself and having, in, having been involved in uh, working with university students. Right. So that's, that basically what, that's, that's basically how summer of Bitcoin came about um, in my previous role at, at a big, at the big, big tech company, I, was deeply involved with working with university students and onboarding them to new technologies. Um, and I figured that, you know, Bitcoin was still illegitimate. I mean, it's obviously legitimate around the world, but it was especially leg illegitimate um, in universities, right, among student circles. Um, and I found that um, quite strange, like my own introduction to Bitcoin was when I was a student. But I just happened to be, I just happened to chance upon it. Um, it wasn't talked about enough as a technology, as a protocol, as a distributed system thing, right? In, in university even circles, late, in classes. And even as late as 2017, 2018, right? Yeah, it's exactly. only in the last kind of cycle in the last two, three years that it has entered maybe some American universities, but generally much more acceptable yeah. now, just yeah. very recently. Absolutely. And, you know, even those are exceptions, right? So I was, you know, a year ago, I was talking to a prominent researcher at MIT and they spoke about how it's so hard for them to get funding for Bitcoin projects, right? So this is MIT and they already have a Bitcoin club and that still doesn't enjoy as much acceptance as you would expect, you know, as, as you wow. see in other technologies. Um, and so, wow, so I, tragic. I, wow. Exactly. And so, you know, yeah. I had the same feeling, I had the same uh, realization and I wanted to sort of help move the needle in terms of uh, students 
getting exposed to the technology the protocol itself how different pieces of you know the protocol the network come together to solve a very interesting problem that actually ends up reinventing money and so of course i know, want to talk about summer of bitcoin in detail you also mm-hmm. mentioned just before we started recording that you are involved with blockstream did i get that yeah, correct that's right i so, so yeah you, i'm yeah so, so, so tell us a little bit about that and then we'll do a deep dive in summer sure. of bitcoin right so you know i i started summer of bitcoin as a non-profit thing and then eventually i joined uh, blockstream as a product lead on uh, working on some of their lightning technologies um so i basically juggle right now uh, most of my time you know i i sort of work on lightning technology at blockstream and then i have a team who works with me to uh, steward summer of bitcoin so for the audience just give a brief introduction of blockstream as well Sure. So, uh, Blockstream is a um, it does a number of things, and it's a company. It's a Bitcoin company that was founded in twenty, I think, fourteen or fifteen, um, by several prominent uh, Bitcoin developers at the time. Uh, our CEO is Adam Back, who was you know uh, one of the people uh, referenced by Satoshi in the Bitcoin white paper. Um, he was obviously someone who invented hashcash uh, way back in the 90s that was eventually used by satoshi in uh, his proof of work um algorithm in bitcoin itself um and yeah so you know we uh blockstream does a number of things you know we we have a lightning team uh that is working on core lightning which is a lightning implementation of uh which is a lightning network implementation you know we we as you can see on the screen we've got mining uh services and products we've got a uh, liquid network which is a side chain that allows you to do that allows you to extend the capabilities of bitcoin um i think we also a- have a hardware wallet uh for for you know you to store your bitcoin in cold storage and there's bitcoin satellite uh which allows you to connect to the bitcoin network via satellites yeah That's so awesome. again i mean this is this introduction you know a lot of people in the non bitcoin world do not know about blockstream but i just just for the audience i want to tell them that it's it's a massive deal out there in the bitcoin world and adam back the way uh, you know adi mentioned his name is i mean he's <laughs> he's somewhat of a absolute uh, personality in bitcoin huge contributor i yeah. think he was mentioned in the in satoshi's white paper as well right of course for hashcash that's exactly yeah that's you right know? so yeah i mean that's 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 amazing it's a company which does amazing things including uh you know that uh, they've satellite connection to for, to kind of propagate bitcoin transactions and loads of interesting stuff do you think you can get adam back uh, as a guest on my podcast i've written to i've written emails to him he doesn't respond so i'm going to i'm going to now i'm going to be, be behind you to get him on a podcast i have a photograph with him in a uh-huh. shitcoin event way back in <laughs> consensus 2017 okay. yeah. and i was it was again tragic it was i mean it was a crypto event and blockstream was like behind the, somewhere and i was like what nonsense is this that the biggest the most important company in the space should be right like front and all of these shitcoin scammy you know companies are all over the place and um, you know but yeah no uh, amazing and uh, uh, you want to give a brief introduction of lightning network to the audience Yes, absolutely. In which so, involved. Yeah, so so Lightning Network is essentially a layer two technology on Bitcoin. Um, you know, you can think of Bitcoin as a settlement layer where every transaction settles. You know, with um, a, a big enough guarantee in, let's say, a few hours. Uh, especially if you're moving large amounts and um, and where you don't you don't want any trust involved uh, or any counterparty trust, right? and lightning network scales that to a uh, many more transactions uh let's say per minute or per unit of time um and something that settles instant instantaneously um you know you're talking about microseconds and also perhaps micro transactions right so small amounts you know as as low as few cents or in in a microsecond across the world anywhere you want right so so it's kind of it's kind of like the paypal or the credit card network on top of the banking network in yeah. from, in bitcoin's exactly. world a terrible analogy but closest to what we have in the, you know in the trade five world right. and what do you what do you think is the state of the lightning network since you're so closely involved 
in its kind of implementation, development at Blockstream? Well, so because I don't think any normal people are using Lightning, right? When do you think a normal guy uh, without knowing would be would end up using Lightning? Well, so I think the Lightning Network has grown tremendously in the last few years, especially the last two years. You know, we're we're looking at a hockey stick growth in terms of its adoption, in terms of the number of transactions and, and the volume of Bitcoin flowing through the network. Um, the whole country of El Salvador, I've heard. Uh, essentially runs on the Lightning Network, right? Apart from USD, of course. Um, so they're leveraging Lightning Network for day-to-day -day payments in their daily lives. And these are the common citizens that we are talking about. Um, and, you know, you're starting to see some interesting use cases come up in terms of remittance. So you've got a company called Strike, which is doing uh, some pretty useful um, uh, uh, stuff in terms of remitting money to countries in South America or you know, even in Africa, right? So all using of this is essentially, network. exactly. All of this is essentially using the Lightning Network rails. Um, and so, you know, you can think of Lightning Network as something that is competing with not just credit cards, of course, or banking, uh, but also the likes of Western Union or SWIFT in that it is challenging the status quo when it comes to fast transactions, microtransactions without any intermediaries and with extremely low fees. And within Blockstream, in Lightning, what are you doing? Like what's the objective of the product that you guys are working on? Right, so I work as a product lead uh, or you can say a product manager uh, in the Lightning team. Um, one of the things that I'm helping with, of course, is uh, the core Lightning uh, project itself. The Core Lightning project is essentially an implementation of the Lightning Network protocol. Um, so you've got the Lightning Network, which is defined in a sort of a specification, a, a set of documents that defines and specifies how the network should operate. And Core Lightning is an implementation or an instance of that protocol. Um, so I help uh, sort of, you know, you know, help with that Core Lightning project uh, as a product manager. Um, and, you know, we also have a slew of uh, products and services that we're building on the top of Core Lightning, uh, one of which is Greenlight, uh, which essentially allows or is, is a Lightning as an infrastructure solution. So it allows developers to integrate Lightning in their software seamlessly. Now tell us a little bit about Summer of Bitcoin. And when you talk about it, I think I might just pull it up on the screen as well. Yeah. So... You know, as you can see on the screen, Summer of Bitcoin is a way for us to introduce uh, university students to Bitcoin. Um, and the way we do that is, you know, we organize an internship program every summer uh, for students around the world who are in university or even in a high school program. And they get to learn about Bitcoin. They get to contribute to Bitcoin open source projects under the mentorship of several open source developers who are themselves involved in spearheading a number of these open source Bitcoin projects. And finally, at the end of the internship, you know, if they're successful, they earn a stipend uh, as, you know, as every internship uh, has. So, so what was it? So you kind of spoke about why you, you know, you, what inspired yeah. you, when did it start? How did you decide to really get into it and, you know, kickstart this project? Sure. Um, as I said, you know, I, I sort of figured out that there was a problem in that, you know, Bitcoin was especially illegitimate in university circles, right? Among university students. And even among university students, you would expect the students who are studying computer science to actually be introduced to Bitcoin, right? Um, because it solved an important uh, computer science problem, the Byzantine generals problem. And it was just an amazing um, solution that encompassed, you know, cryptography, distributed systems, security, game theory, networking, uh, really everything that computer science touches, right? There are various subdomains in computer science and Bitcoin essentially used uh, all of those to, you know, create a novel solution to solve this problem. And I felt that was something to be studied uh, and marveled at, right? Uh, and even that wasn't happening. Like, you can forget about the societal impact that something like Bitcoin could make. Even as a technology, it is something as innovative as anything else in the last few decades, especially in the technology or computer science domain. 
and so that that was a problem that we wanted to sort of address um and so we figured out that you know by helping students contribute to bitcoin it may be possible to uh help them understand what bitcoin is and how it works and not only that but maybe extend it to maybe inspire them to consider a career in the bitcoin industry once they graduate from university so that was how it it all started um we launched in 2021 um i you know i had tremendous help from several organizations in the space especially chain code labs and spiral uh who are both these uh, bitcoin organizations who are really spearheading open source bitcoin development and so you know with their backing and several other organizations in the space who came on board as sponsors we were able to kick start this program um in 2021 uh, we had about 5000 applications uh, we you know we, we did a pilot in india of course uh, in the first year because i was here in india um and then eventually we uh, in 2022 we expanded the program globally we had uh, about 20000 applicants um and then eventually uh, i think we selected about 80 interns to work on around 30 open source bitcoin projects and these were students from really i think 15 countries uh who many of them who you know contributed or understood bitcoin for the first time contributed to it and also received their first bitcoin and now uh, quite a few of them are considering a career in the bitcoin industry some have already started they either joined bitcoin companies or they're looking to um, apply and you know get a job in the industry so you said very large number of students have applied but then you said specifically like about 80 students did the program so is yeah. there a filtering criteria so it's it's not like if you apply you can just enter the program yes absolutely so you know you apply uh, we you know we 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 essentially you have to go through a screening process where we assess your programming capability um or if you're applying as a designer you know we assess your design skills so we have two tracks one is a developer track and a designer track and once you go through the screening round uh you know with various challenges involved um as we sort of go on, go on and filter these students um there's a there's a proposal round where you know we we expect you to write project proposals uh for the open source projects that you are interested in contributing to uh there's an optional interview round as well that these open source developers who act as men- mentors take uh for the students to you know further filter through the process and we finally finally ended up selecting about you know 80 students in the first year about 50 students sorry 50 students in the first year about 80 students in the next second year which is last year the reason i mean of, of obviously we are sort of constrained with the number of mentors that we have um and all, also the number of projects so we can only cater to uh, a handful of them um um but yeah i mean hopefully as the number of projects increase as the number of mentors um grow uh you know we can start taking on more and more students year by year so it's not like an open course where or something where the like you know you just go online and you learn about bitcoin it's not like it's a very involved almost like a university type program where there's a filtering process your chances of getting into the program are also i mean they it's a pretty strict process yeah. uh correct so what what kind of students are you looking for i mean what are the minimum requirements as you mentioned there are two tracks there's a developer mm-hmm. track so for a developer track who would be a typical student that would apply to this uh right. to this track and then even for the designer track right so firstly you know to be eligible for summer of bitcoin you have to be in a university program or a high school program and then finally if you're interested in applying to the developer track we expect you to have some programming capability or some programming experience uh and if you are in a designer track we expect you to have some sort of a design portfolio maybe you have created ui mocks or maybe you have uh, done some ux research so we can assess that you'll be a good fit uh, as a designer in a particular project so for the developer track it seems like that's the minimum requirement but who would typically get in because okay I, if you have yeah. some some programming uh, knowledge you could apply but i don't think there would be a chance to get in because there's so much competition to get in right yeah um i think so we, we've seen the most successful students be not just great at programming uh, but also understand the ethos of open source um development um and they are great communicators so they are able to articulate their ideas and communicate effectively you know most of the open source happens in public 
um, and you know it, it happens uh, over text or maybe GitHub, and so you you're expected to be very well articulate in your writing, in your communication, so that you can communicate with other developers in the team, you know, who may be across the world and maybe from a totally different culture, and yeah, so th that's sort of some of the attributes of uh, the successful interns we have had in in the last two years. And who who's teaching the program? Like, how did you develop the content? How did right. that come together? Right. So I should say the content is itself open, by the way. So you can, you know, if even if you don't apply or even if you applied and don't get in, uh, you can still essentially go through all of the content uh, and learn Bitcoin all by yourself. Um, this can year, you where the content is, like, I mean, just since... So uh, if you go to how it works in student guide, you'll essentially, yeah. Yeah, it'll essentially take you through the entire Summer of Bitcoin program, all of the content that we have in terms of getting started with Bitcoin, understanding the technical as well as the economic side of things, um, and then all the different projects that we have across the space. So you'll see all of the you know books, video lectures, articles, all of the curriculum on our website in the student guide. And so uh, definitely a non-tech audience maybe could read some of this stuff, yep. but cannot really go through the, maybe could follow some of the stuff from the designer track. Yeah. I mean, there are some yeah. great resources mentioned there. Absolutely. Um, and especially this year, we have partnered with Sailor Academy um, to, uh, so Sailor Academy has two really awesome courses. One is Bitcoin for everybody and the other is Bitcoin for developers. And those two courses are the prerequisite for the Summer of Bitcoin program. So every student applicant is expected to complete those prerequisites on sailor.org, uh, which is where they have hosted these two courses. That's and those are great important. introductions, right? So if, if you're a non-technical person, Bitcoin for everybody is amazing. If you are, if you're somewhat uh, interested in the technical side of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin for developers is a great introduction to uh, all things technical and Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. So as while well, while I was while you were talking about a Sailor Academy, I was trying to see if I could pull it up on the screen, but it's okay. I'll maybe put a link in the show notes below. Yeah. Um, and who who are the teachers? Like, uh, uh, is is there a lecture format? Like, do you have live lectures? And if yes, then who's giving them? Right. So, you know, uh, all, all these years, uh, both in 2021, in 2022, and this year, we partner with several. Um, Bitcoin educators in this space uh, to help our applicants, you know, understand Bitcoin, ask questions, you know, have office hours and organize seminars around various different facets of Bitcoin, where we invite members from the Bitcoin community who may be themselves developers or educators to, you know, talk about Bitcoin of you know, in terms of all its different facets, right? So if, you know, and we, we organize... Globally? People are coming yeah. and helping you globally, or is it typically? It's all global. So the so, whole program. How's the yeah, response the when you reached out to these people? What was the response? Because it's a new program, you know, and it's like two years old. And like, how, how what was the response that, that you got from them? Well, so you know, the whole community obviously has been super encouraging and super supportive. Uh, I, you know, Summer of Bitcoin would be nothing without the community sort of stepping forward and volunteering their time um, and expertise to help these young kids understand Bitcoin, contribute to it, and maybe consider a career in the industry. Um, so we are very grateful to have uh, this community who are uh, more of missionaries uh, and you know they, they understand that it's important to nurture the youth. It's important to expose them to this really uh, important technology and you know, help improve it, uh, secure it, make it more resilient and make it more accessible for everyone around the earth. Yeah. If you get involved into Bitcoin, you become a missionary. I mean, it's, it happens yeah. together. Um, and uh, the companies that are sponsoring Summer of Bitcoin, are they typically crypto Bitcoin companies or are there any trade fire companies as well? Well, so I think so far, um, all of the organizations that are sponsors of Summer of Bitcoin, they are obviously involved in Bitcoin. Um, so if you go to our website um, under sponsors on the, I think it's yeah, on the top right. Um, so these are all the mentors, right? 
uh, if yeah. you go to yeah so th- these are all the sponsors that we had um last year um and you can see all of them are involved in bitcoin in some sense you know some are uh, so spiral is essentially an arm of block which is a fintech company in the us that also dabbles in bitcoin you know the famous cash app uh, is one of their products coinbase is obviously uh, a, a big player in the industry you've got ledger that makes the hardware wallets cathedra marathon are miners uh, super lunar is an offshoot of gemini which is an, another exchange in in the industry uh, nidig is of course a bitcoin institution uh, hrf uh, is um, you know helps with human rights issues across the world including uh, supporting bitcoin um, and build on- that you have them as a sponsor that's pretty cool did you reach out to them or they found out about you when they wanted to sponsor you well so you know hrf particularly has um, an application process i believe you have to apply for a grant and you know they essentially go through a process a selection of sorts and uh, yeah help both individuals as well as organizations in the space who are helping bitcoin move forward right and, and what do you think since you're so closely associated with open source development and even at blockstream and you know bitcoin essentially what do you what do you make of it from a dev, you know are developers interested because there is this also kind of thinking that prevails right that um open source development the incentives are not there for developers mm. and especially in countries like india where it's mm. really risky for developers and you know developers need job security and they need a consistent paycheck to come every month uh, so what do you think about open source development in countries like india well so you would be surprised to know that india essentially has i think the largest number of open source developers as measured by github right so github tracks essentially all of the open source contributors or the contributions that come in or that happen on their platform and i think they had an article maybe last year or a year before that where they saw that the largest number of contributors were essentially from india um and that's actually got to do with not just the sheer population size that india enjoys uh, but also the population size of developers and programmers themselves right so india is a software powerhouse uh, we've got software developers really across the companies across the technology industry um and naturally a consequence of that is we also happen to have the largest number of open source contributors um who are living in india or have you know indian origins uh, and are contributing to open source projects um so to be clear summer of bitcoin accepts students globally and it's a global program it's online yeah. you do it on your laptop yes. computer right that's right yeah um yeah sorry sorry what was your question again no i was just asking about open source development in india which you answered mm. uh yeah. and what do you do you have any comment on the current state of the market of the ftx contagion or do you sure. keep yourself away from all of this uh all all the news around the price and all of this and focus just on development well so obviously price is an important um dimension of bitcoin right as at the end of the day it's a market good you know you have a price to it the market prices it in a certain sense um and it and is so down along with the price like the price today we are recording this on 16th feb the price has increased by 10% one of those days where the price moves more than 10% to the positive are you did, did you wake up in a better mood uh well not really so yeah i, I think in terms of tracking the price every day I've, i've sort of lost track of it i i i don't really check price that often um you know it it may fall into my radar but i don't have an app or or some ticker on my screen uh to to track its price um i think my my this thesis of course everybody who's involved in bitcoin development so just before you had mahin uh you know founder of liminal ex yeah. co-founder with me at zepe he had no idea about the price rally as well uh and i just love the fact that people who are building on bitcoin don't really care about it at all like they know it's going to happen it's eventually whatever needs to happen and i just love the fact that you know you guys are building and that's what you're interested in yeah absolutely that's right um yeah i mean so the day to day fluctuations is something that you know you get used to if you are uh, in the industry for a number of years and then there are just so many other things that you're involved in in terms of building things out building the technology out the community out uh that it's just uh 
yeah the, the the price doesn't even come on mind and what do you think uh, of the state of bitcoin in india from a regulate from regulatory perspective you're there you're of course working with all of these really hardcore bitcoiners and with blockstream which is at the epicenter of bitcoin really uh and it's tragic the state of bitcoin in india what do you what do you feel since you're there so honestly if the last few years have been sort of splitting my time between india uh, the us and dubai um so i haven't sort of spent a lot of time in india on the ground um having said that i mean i continue to sort of keep myself up to date with the news i think uh india is in a very interesting position you know historically it it has been it it has had to be subservient to the the us dollar hegemony right um and now with the changing geopolitics uh it's trying to assert its rightful place in the world you know as the largest uh, democracy as well as you know a, a people of over 1.2 billion um and and so naturally you know it, in a couple of years the largest country actually yeah exactly even across yeah <laughs> and so you know it 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 it's it's in a very interesting time uh, and place in uh, in in the world right now and so naturally the discussion around currency itself is is uh, is a very important um discussion uh, for the government as well as the central bank you know they're looking at it not just in terms of the not just in terms of its stability uh, for the indian populace but also its place in the global markets um and so you know balaji uh, who is uh, you know one of the vcs in the space has often talked about how um you know either you know going how you know india can sort of take a third approach you know you either are uh, going with the us dollar or with the chinese one but then there's a third approach which you know is essentially a uh, on the lines of adopting an open money and decentralized money that essentially listens to no one so you know as we all know like india has had non alignment position in terms of its uh, you know in terms of its geopolitical outlook and so bitcoin very well aligns with uh, such a such an outlook right where you're not aligned to any other country and you're not even asserting your own position on somebody else uh, but you are essentially living um you you're essentially uh, in a non alignment non aligned movement where it you know you're working for your own general populace at the same time choosing to not harm uh, any other, any other uh, country out there in the world um and so you know bitcoin sort of naturally fits into that narrative uh, but obviously it takes time for governments to understand new technologies and then adopt it so my my sense is that the government today in india is skeptical of of bitcoin and all the noise that comes with it right it's not just bitcoin for them it's thousand other coins and tokens that are involved in a lot of scams and and so in general they are uh very conservative when it comes to bitcoin and you know the larger crypto industry and rightfully so i think uh to their to their credit um you know bitcoin is still a small um player in in this whole game of currencies right and so i i feel like it it might be a while until bitcoin becomes mature enough for governments around the world to to look at it uh as a serious asset that they can adopt um to to strengthen their own uh, place in in the in the geopolitic uh, uh world um and and so so that's what my view is i think it's early for them i think they are sort of trading carefully they're obviously skeptical uh and conservative when it comes to any sort of adoptions in the country um and you know these things have a natural way of playing out uh right now my sense is that while the government may be open or maybe pro technology in general i think the rbi really feels that you know something like bitcoin and all of these things that other crypto tokens enable are maybe a threat to uh the indian rupee itself and you know it's it's understandable where they come from um i hope that the conversation over this decade um you know goes from just sort of banning bitcoin or not talking about it to actually engaging in meaningful dialogue with all the different stakeholders and considering bitcoin as uh, as really an important force uh in in world economics um so hopefully that that happens that pans out uh this decade 
yeah, I've had a first-hand experience uh, exactly. <laughs> in this process, I think from 20, especially in 2017, in the last cycle. Um, and yeah, we think about the government as just this one word, but it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's just so many people involved and it's a really frustrating, painful process, especially when you come from your own beliefs and you understand how beneficial a technology could be and the exact opposite narrative is there in the government. But um, before we wrap up, Adi, how can people find you? I don't think you want people to find you, but then how can people find some of Bitcoin? Sure. So, well, I mean, if you if you want to find me, I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at Adi underscore Shankara underscore. Uh, that's me on Twitter. You can check out Summer of Bitcoin at summerofbitcoin.org. Uh, you can check out Blockstream and all the things that we do at blockstream.com. Um, and yeah, my, my DMs are open. Uh, you know, if, if anyone wants to chat anytime, happy to. Adi, been a privilege. Thank you for doing this and thanks for coming on 21 Towers. Thank you, Sandeep, for having me. It was fun.